Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Patricia. Uh, I was delighted to be invited to have this, my first conversation, live conversation with Dean Yates and to meet his wife, Mary Binks. Mary um, is definitely a really big presence in Dean Yates's memoir. She comes across in the book as a, a definite shining light. So it's a real treat, I think, for everyone tuning in to be able to speak to both of you together this evening. And I understand that this is the first time you've spoken together about this book and about your experience of PTSD. That's right, um, Clotilde, so it's a bit of an exclusive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think it's worthwhile just talking about why, we, we touched on this very briefly, but why you wanted to do this together. Yeah, I think it's important that uh, as as uh, a couple uh, that we're able to share our experiences of what it was like for the whole family uh, to go through what what the whole family has gone through. I, I mean, I, I write uh, very intimately about the experiences of, of PTSD from my perspective and also write about it from from my family's perspective, but then it's in my words. And so I think it's it's really important that that people get to hear what it was like from, from Mary's perspective in her words. I, I just don't think you can understate the importance of that. And yeah. Mary, what made you want to join Dean for the first time to talk about this together? I think it's um, very important um, to hear a partner's perspective, um, another journalist as well, um, because I have seen uh, the pressures that um, journalists are under, the level of trauma, the um, marriage breakups, the um, alcohol and drug dependency, and I'm not saying that that characterizes journalism, but um, it, it, it's a it can be a very traumatic area to work in. So there are lots of pressures. You travel a lot, um, and PTSD. I think at the time when Dean uh, was diagnosed, wasn't something that people were. Um, it was a term that we weren't really very familiar with. In fact, the, I mean, the, the funny the funny thing was 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 when I was first posted to Baghdad, for example, as the bureau chief in in uh, when I first got the job in two thousand and six, Mary and I had long conversations about that role, and we talked about the physical safety for myself. We talked about the pressures I would be under. We talked about the dangers to my staff and all this sort of thing. We had long conversations about the risks. We never once talked about the psychological risks to myself. That's that gives you a sense of how limited the knowledge of PTSD was back then uh Absolutely. which I think you know is quite is quite is, is quite shocking in a way it's good to be reminded of the context that you went out you were existing in and working in when you took on that job because I'm sure you were expecting it to be risky I'm sure you were expecting it to be difficult I'm sure you justified it to yourselves because your career was to cover what was going on. And of course, a lot of, you know, you'd made your career covering um, conflicts and trying to make sense of them for the world. And that's what a lot of journalists feel is the is the is where the real meat of the job is when you're covering history unfolding. Now, I, I think it's really interesting that you mentioned you looked into the physical risks and maybe the risks to your personal safety, your family's safety, the responsibilities you will have had for risk management of the whole bureau. Interestingly, the Rory Pack Trust is, was created to help freelance journalists manage risks. And nearly that twin, it was create, launched in 95, so nearly 30 years ago. And back then, the concern was primarily physical safety. How do you measure your physical safety? How to do a proper risk assessment? How to prepare for operating in a hostile environment or a conflict zone? It was all to, you know, to boil it down. Yep. How do you avoid bleeding out if you're shot? <laughs> right. How do you know where to be, where to be safe in a war zone, that kind of thing. And then of course, very quickly with the development of um, technology, people understood very quickly that digital security had to go hand in hand with physical risk assessments. You couldn't be physically safe if you weren't digitally secure because having a weakness on the digital security front would give away your location, et cetera, et cetera, and mm -hmm. vice versa. And so there's been a joint focus at the trust in our focus on safety for journalists. And then 
So two years ago, we, we've been running support funds for journalists for many years, and, and we noticed about two to three years ago that an increasing amount of requests to our crisis funds were actually from journalists asking for financial support to cover the costs of professional psychological support, the costs of trauma therapy. They just didn't know where to go. They don't want to quit. They want to talk to a clinician that understands journalists because Journal clinicians that don't understand journalism just think, well, you're mad, just stop your job. That's what's making you ill. Of course, that's the last thing you want to do if your whole life's purpose is to work in a traumatic environment. Even um, journalists that are exposed to vicarious trauma, those who are editing live footage back in the safety of a HQ in London or New York, they can experience real um, vicarious trauma as a result of being repeatedly exposed to content. And they find it really difficult to handle that because it seems unacceptable to admit that you might need help when you're in the safety of the edit room. But all of this is, is um, coming out now. And what I'm finding really interesting is there is definitely more talk about psychological safety. I just heard from Patricia that they've been holding more webinars for the OPC about psychological safety, which is great. Two years ago at the Royal Peck Trust, we launched what we called a resilience program where we um, we partnered with the DART Center on Trauma and Journalism to give journalists lots of training on trauma-aware journalism, covering both sides of what trauma-aware journalism is, which is, how do you interview traumatized victims in a sensitive way? But also, how do you spot any trauma you may be carrying as a result of your repeated exposure to traumatic events? And because you can't be the best journalist you can be without managing your own health, be that physical mm. and mental, et cetera. Um, so I think the psychological side is actually absolutely intertwined with the physical risk assessment and the digital security and of course, now with the growing legal attacks that are being um, the growing use of um, people weaponizing the war against journalists, mm -hmm. legal risk awareness is coming into play as well. Now, what's I think really key to our discussion tonight is the fact that the psychological safety or the psychological health of journalists impacts so much on their loved ones and their families. And as Mary said, there is an undeniable impact on the partners of the patient, PTSD patients or anyone really um, struggling with trauma. It definitely bleeds over into your personal relationships. And we know from many um, scientists' research, including Anthony Feinstein, that one of the key protectors of psychological um, damage and trauma is strong familial bonds. So I would really like to ask you, Dean, when you, you say, you know, in the introduction, Patricia was saying you had a drive to get better. Where, when did you know you weren't well and what made you, gave you that drive to get better? Well, actually, to be honest with you, uh, I was unwell for many years. Um, I had a lot of the symptoms of PTSD, the classic symptoms of PTSD, the emotional numbness, um, the flashbacks, uh, and I was suffering, my family was suffering, but I was in denial about that. And Mary was trying to make it clear to me that I was struggling and that I needed help, but I refused to believe it. And one of the reasons that I refused to believe that there was anything wrong with me was that I could still do my job. I was still managing to to work and to do and to perform well and and this is one of the this is one of the things about ptsd is that people can compartmentalize their personal life and their work life mm -hmm. and 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 this went on for years and I, I i was just i was fortunate that mary never gave up trying to get me to seek help and it got to a point where in 2016 i was so unwell that um, Mary was able to, I guess, convince me that the time had come that I needed to see a psychiatrist and that uh, I literally got a diagnosis within 45 minutes. Uh, it was that clear that I had PTSD. 
And that was a bit of a, that, I wouldn't call it a turning point because there was still a long road ahead in terms of um, coming to an emotional acceptance that I had PTSD. And I still had to go through, I, I guess, an acceptance of the diagnosis and then um, fully accept that I had that condition and, and get to a point where, I mean, I, I unraveled further. But once I once I got to that emotional acceptance that I had PTSD, then I thought, this is this is a this is almost, it was almost like a story that I had to understand, and this was going to be the biggest story of my life. And I thought I'm going to throw the kitchen sink at it, like any journalist would. I'm going to absolutely throw everything I've got to, I've got at it, understand it, confront it, and work out what it is I've got to do to get on top of it. And that was the obsession that I brought to it to work out what it was. And at the same time, I just had Mary and my kids giving me all the support that I needed to uh, to, to battle it. Uh, 